Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at a Cura Micro Speech. This is for the C64. Uh, now it's got a, uh, this on here. It's annoying they didn't uh, mention that in the um, advert there. No picture. So I'm guessing something's killing the uh, data bus there. You're going to have uh, one or more ROMs. These might might both be ROMs here, but I suspect not. I suspect we've got some address decoding or something going on in one of these. Another one's going to be the ROM, and then we've got the speech chip up here. It's exactly the same one that you saw in a previous video on the um, Spectrum uh, micro speech actually. Uh, and I've got a couple of these as spare chips from uh, Alice Shalas as original uh, spares collection. Uh, so I think we're going to plug this in, see what it's doing. So before powering this up, I've checked the pin out there for the car. The top row there, the left hand pin is ground, the two next to it are VCC. So it's with the chips facing upwards and if I switch it on, you could hear the sound there, just but there's no video. Which, yeah, that's a bit worrying. Feeling the tops of the chips there, they are stone cold. So yeah, it's not booting. Um, I did reflow these two chips here. Um, made no difference at all, and I've cleaned the connector up both sides as well. So I think the next thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the speech chip there. I'm not sure whether that's on the data bus or whether that gets fed through uh, one of these chips here before we have, you know, a data bus connectivity. Maybe to one of those, well both of those I would assume. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. But I think we'll start with that because I've got a spare. So if we took that off and the system boots, that might be positive in the sense that, yeah, I could put my spare on there and we could try that. So I'm just going to use the desolder station here just to free this chip up. I don't think this is going to solve it. If I'm honest, I think it's either the ROM or the one that's doing some decoding. So I got rid of all the solder up on both sides. So we'll just pivot a little bit like that on a three or four pins at the same time just to snap them off the edges. And then hopefully it uh, should come off, I think. Yeah, you can see it's coming up there. There's a little bit of solder there still. There we go, chip removed. So it's just the same, and I might not be able to recover this at all. But I just want to show you, this is the five volts rail here, these two pads. It comes up here, it goes over the top of this chip here, and it goes down under a trace to this top pin here. And there's no connection at all. And I'll just see if I can show you, I don't know if you can see this. Um, can you see? The trace it comes it's dark there, it comes here and it goes underneath. You might just be able to sort of see that and it joins to that pin. Top right here. But there's no join. I've tested it all the way up here as far as I can. So it would appear it's just not joined to the pin. I'm gonna try and flow some solder on the top side here, get it to join, I think, and then try it again. I've reconnected that back up. Now bear in mind that's the VCC pin on that ROM there, or uh, whatever it is. So we could have killed it with latch up, but the main thing is you can see it's booting now. And the reason, the reason we were not getting it booting before is obviously because it had no power. So there's no ROM, yet the jumpers on that board are going to be configured in such a way to bypass the kernel. Um, I'm guessing. So the reason that wasn't working is because obviously there's no power to the ROM chip effectively so um, yeah so we could have a you know it could have killed it with latch up there those chips do get a little bit warm when it's been on so uh, have we got a fault no idea I'm now going to get the uh, speech chip back on there now so apologies it's raining but uh, yeah you can have a listen hopefully as this uh, rain stops if I type in it it should in theory yes initialize it Cura Computer, we can't even spell computer, can we? Components Limited. Um, okay, I'm not sure 
what that gives us. Now I've got a little speaker connected up, the volume might be down, I'm not sure. So as you'll see in a minute, I got some sound. This is how actually, it was a little amplification box I got from the late Alison Shalis. Um, so yeah, I'm very grateful for Colin sending this to me. And all I did is connect up a, a phono lead there. I clipped a couple of crop clips onto the connector, one to the ground of the C64 and then the center pin there for the signal. I just connected it to the pin on the DIN actually that comes out the back of the Speech 64. There we go, so the rain stopped. Sweet! So yeah, pleasantly surprised. I didn't think there was a very high level of confidence, you know, of getting this thing working again. But uh, yeah, I mean, I need to clean off all the flux on off here now, you know, get some IPA on here and to push it down. Before I do that, I'm going to put you on macro and just give you a close up of the the bad connection, so you can see what the issue was. Well, you perhaps can't see it as well now because I've soldered it. Now the future is 8-bit, sells shells, so I think I'm going to order a shell for this and at the point where the top half of the shell joins the bottom half, you can just put a little cut in either side, you know, to make a little hole there and then the wire should trail out the side. I think I'm going to do that. I think while I'm here I might just swap out these caps as well, why not? So this trace here, can you see, this is the VCC rail, comes all the way up here, 5 volts and uh, as we re reach the pin over here, the trace, you can't see it now because you can just see solder on top of it, but the trace there was just like this here, you know, just tinned with a very slight amount of solder. And then when it got to the pin here, it was kind of folded up, you know, like it had been lifted off the PCB upwards, so there was a gap. There's no way it could ever have worked, so I just squashed it down, put a bit of flux there, and then applied some solder here and it flowed along there. So yeah, in theory I should perhaps take this off and I can show you the damage better, but um, yeah, and I might just clean this up a little bit more, add a bit more flux on there and reflow that just to make that tidy. But that was the problem. The problem was the 5 volts was coming up here and ending here. So it was never getting to any of these chips, they were all just sort of sat there. And as I said, uh, you know, one of my concerns was when you get that scenario you can start to get latch up problems and things if, you, you know, if you're not careful. Um, but the reason it was just not booting presumably is because one of these ROMs must sit perhaps in the boot area, I'm not sure. Um, what would happen if you've got a floating ROM, you know, because the jumpers are set on here, so the C64 is going to be trying to address the, the ROM, uh, or ROMs, I'm not really sure, like I say, I think one of these is some address decoding, I think the other one's a ROM, they might both be ROMs. Um, I don't think there's any dumps of these out there either, so that might be the thing I might consider, I might see if I can work out if the pin out so these are standard and I might try and dump um, whichever is the ROM. Yeah and I'll swap the caps out last, those two capacitors. I've not got the same type there. Um, I always forget, forget whether it's radial or axial. But anyway, yeah I've not got any of that type I don't think. Yeah the 25 volt 10 microfarad, I think they're both the same. So we'll have a go with the uh, toothbrush now. It helps to get the cotton fibres off as well if you've got any cotton fibres on there from cotton swabs. Just cleaning the uh, PCB edge top and bottom here you can see how dirty that was actually. I mean part of that is because it's solder, you know it's just solder that's on there. These aren't gold plated or anything like that. So you do kind of get, look every time you rub it you get a kind of black bit off there anyway. It's kind of like the, the probably the lead and tin. So I've cleaned up the board on the bottom and the top side there, it's looking pretty clean. I used the fiberglass pen actually in a few places just to get some of the oxidisation off um, the traces and things there. So the next thing I'm going to do is remove and replace these caps. You can see you've got some Panasonic M-Class uh, caps here. Yeah, both are brand new. Slightly low voltage, 16 volts, but yeah, these are rated at 25 I think. There's no way you're going to have 25 volts on there at all, so these will these will be fine. So let's get the first one off. There might be a fair bit of uh, solder holding these on the other side actually, I'm not sure. Yeah, the pin there is bent over. Super annoying when they're bent over like that. It's just trying to work out which way it's bent. There we go, it's coming out I think. I suspect I'm going to need to sort of try and pull it 
from the other side. Oh no, it's coming off there now. So the way I'm going to fit these is sideways like that. So the band is towards the bottom there, so you can see I've got that through there. Uh, and then I'll bend this out, stick some heat shrink over it and join it up down there. So that's one done. I'll uh, heat that in a minute with hot air to shrink it and tighten it. You can see it goes right down to the bottom almost. It'll shrink a little bit, but it should do the job. Uh, and it's lifted up on this side here, so it's not going to be anywhere near down here anyway. Uh, this one couples the audio, and this one is uh, across the 5 volts, so it goes between the uh, VCC rail here, and I think that's ground. Um, yeah, so that's, like say, a smoothing cap. So I didn't show you on the previous one there, but what I've been doing is cleaning up underneath here just with a fiberglass pen. As you can see, just getting any of that oxidisation off there before I fit the uh, other cap. There we go, that's both caps done. Uh, it doesn't look very straight, it's the heat shrink that's not straight. So I'll just uh, heat these with uh, some hot air now. See if we can shrink that. It's only set to about 160 this actually so it's not super 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 hot yeah that'll do I think so it's going dark here now but what I'm gonna do can you see this it's a five pin den and it's the female uh, counterpart so what I'm going to do is put this in parallel with this actually, just a short, I'll have a short lead coming off the back there, uh, all five connections passing straight through, um, which means you'll be able to plug this into the video port on the C64, I'm guessing the audio goes in to the SID on the in input pin, and then obviously the video and audio will come out here in a kind of normal AV cable. So as you can see the replacement shell arrived and uh, it's not quite the right dimensions there's a few things with this actually you can see it almost fits I suspect if I file off you can just about see there's a bit of lip you know an edge there just file you know at half a millimeter off each side there it should fit within the cavity okay it's going to need to sit down here like that so that the uh, edge is right down here this is obviously going to be a problem um, I can cut that off that's not a problem smooth that down um, put something over there just to cover that hole and I was thinking um, what I'm going to need to do is obviously stop it from sliding up that way now I might not have a problem there depending on these catches actually if I yeah I might just need to shave a little bit of these down so that it fits there I'm not sure I might end up losing the clips on the front it's going to be hard to yeah it's going to be hard to do this I think might have to lose these clips down here but those ones up there will support it and then I've just got to find some way of securing it together so there's some serious uh, fudgery going on here uh, really I've been clipping bits down now if I'd not clipped as much off this piece here that would actually hold the PCB from going too far in what I've ended up doing is the stub that we cut off you know from the inside of the shell here in fact I'll just pull the board out let's put that on the SD map um, yeah, the one we chopped off there, I've turned it upside down, roughed up the underside and super glued it down. And you can see I've just been experimenting with uh, one of these um, hex uh, mounts and you know, I trimmed it down to size and it fits the cavity there, it's really snug. I think I'm going to epoxy that in place actually and all that's going to do, you can feel it's a bit loose actually, you know, it's, it's, it's snug but I can move it. it all it's going to do is support that post and that post is stopping the board from coming too far up. There's no problem going back that way uh, because it's kind of like caught on the edge down here but yeah that'll just help uh, you know get the maximum distance on the edges there so yeah it's a total fudge but as you can see it goes together when the PCV's in the clips at the top hold it quite well but I will need to secure it somehow so I'm going to need to I don't know stick some tape or something on the sides uh, and maybe on the back here just to hold it together but it's better than nothing that's for sure so yeah, fudgery ahoy, piece of black vinyl there, piece of black vinyl there, piece of black vinyl there, just to secure it. It does clip at the top, not very well, but yeah, that will now hold together. So, uh, and with the uh, that poster thing epoxied at the back there, it means that the cart is quite a long way forward here. You know, I mean, it's still recessed, as you can see, 
but it's just right. So uh, I'm going to go plug this in and just make sure it's still working. Uh, and then I'll finish off doing the, uh, the pass through that I was doing on here. So I'm using this old cable I've got here. I'm just going to trim these ends off because they don't need to be very long at all, actually. And I've got a female uh, inline uh, DIN here. So the idea is you can plug your, uh, you know, your normal AV cable in and it'll pass through. You know, the wire will join these two up effectively. Um, now, I'd be better off using a shielded cable, actually. It's only a short uh, length, this. But nevertheless, we've got more cores here than we need. In theory, I only need four. So I'm going to do that pin, that pin, uh, the ground, that's three. Skip the audio in. Yeah, we need four, four wires, and then it'll be a total pass-through. The only thing it won't have is the audio in. But I don't use the audio in for anything. I don't think anybody would do, really. This is pretty much the only sort of thing you might want to uh, use with the audio in. So... Uh, yeah, I only need four cores, and I've got, I think, six here. Um, so I'll join, as you can see there, join three of them to um, ground. Because then the ground, you know, they're, they're wound around each other here, so it'll be acting as a bit of a shield. It's not quite as good as a shielded cable, but it's only short. It's only a tiny little thing just to extend it here, and I'm never really going to be using it. The only time I'm going to use it is when I'm using this, which is never, really. So I've soldered my wires there. Not particularly uh, clean. I should use heat shrink tubing, really. Um, I'll perhaps revisit this, I often can't be bothered at the time when I'm doing things like this, but yeah, it is important to do that. And then we'll just carefully slide this back over here, that's it. Sometimes you need to bend these up just a little bit, so that when the uh, housing, yeah, it's alright now, you see that's gripping, when the housing slides it gets caught on it. But you can see that side's done. Uh, now it is important, obviously, you put this thing on before you solder the wires if you, you've got something already fitted on the other side. So there we go, we've gone from testing it with uh, this thing of Allison's here to uh, actually using one of Allison's connectors. Allison's featured uh, a few times in this video. So uh, yeah, I'll connect this up now, but you, as you can see, it's held together perfectly well and I've had this in and out of the C64 a few times there. And I'll just show you, it's super easy to put it in. There we go, that's in. Then we need to plug the AV lead in to the back of the C64 and the normal AV cable into the pass-through. Switch it on. So let's... Uh, just initialize it. Return. Yeah, it says return when you press uh, return there. Oh, Miss Y. Anyway, you can see that's working fine. This is a COM model for 64. Layer sucks. Just in in. So yeah, pleasantly surprised. Um, at the start of this video, I didn't think I was going to get this working, actually. Um, at one point, when there was n when it was not doing anything, you know, it wasn't even booting the C64, I thought, you know, it's going to be game over, it's going to be one of those uh, two ICs there. Not the speech chip, but one of the other two, let's say the ROM or the address decoding. But uh, yeah, it's nice to have uh, managed to salvage this. It's a shame it didn't have its original shell with it, but I guess at least there's plus as well here that I've added this pass-through as well. I'm guessing you maybe got one of these pass-through cables with it, maybe, maybe not, because the, I mean, the fact it uses the uh, audio in there, the audio in connection, it gets merged with the audio anyway, so if you're using an RF lead, which most people would have been back in the day, the sound would have been mixed with your TV sound, so you wouldn't really need this pass-through, but most people these days tend to go for S-Video or Composite, and that's the benefit of having a pass-through like this on one of these. I do hope you found the video interesting. Please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.